right. Welcome to another edition of Millennials Are Killing Capitalism Live. Uh, tonight, we are excited, or it, I guess I won't say tonight because I know some of you are tuning in from all parts of the world, uh, Australia, where it is already tomorrow. Um, <laughs> uh, and so we're excited to have uh, Dr. Alana Lenton. Uh, she is a teacher and a writer and a Jewish European woman who is a settler on Gadigal, Wengal land. I'll let her correct me if I mispronounce that, uh, which is also known as uh, Sydney, Australia. Her work focuses on a critical theorization of race, racism, and anti-racism. She is a professor of cultural and social analysis at Western Sydney University. She is the author and editor of multiple books, including Why Race Still Matters and Racism and Anti-Racism in Europe. Um, you can find out more about Dr. Lenton and her work and the other books that she's a part of editing and writing and co-writing and co-editing at alanalenton.net. That's in the show description. Um, before we get started, I do just want to give a couple of quick shout outs. Um, shout out to um, Rocio and Tracy, who are the first people to become members of our YouTube channel. So you can, there's a little join button that people can click now. We also have super chat and that sort of stuff. So there are some other ways people can interact and uh, support the show, become members of the show. And of course, you can also support us on patreon.com. Uh, another time I'll talk a little bit more about what all of that means, but just know there's various ways to support the show as well as, uh, of course, liking, subscribing, sharing. Um, but enough of that for now. I'll welcome Alana Lenton to the show. Thanks for joining me, Alana. Thanks for having me, Jared. Well, these are obviously, uh, you know, difficult circumstances that we're having this discussion under. Um, we were chatting about this just a little bit before the show, um, but I'm really excited in being able to be in conversation with you about some of these topics. Um, I know you're somebody who spends a lot of time, you know, doing really great work around racism and anti-racism and looking at various different forms of it and um, trying to think about, you know, sort of moral ideas of racism, um, uh, as well as, of course, material impacts of racism, impacts of power. And so um, I'm looking forward to this because there's a lot of ways that racism um, is kind of animating this, um, I mean, you know, the really the ongoing, you know, genocide kind of that we're seeing in, in Gaza right now and mm -hmm. the responses to it from around the world, um, you know, coming off the events of October 7th, which of course come out of a long struggle, um, you know, 75 years plus. So um, the first thing that I wanted to get into conversation with you about is, you know, you are one of our favorite scholars on the topic of racism and racism and anti-racism. And I know I'm speaking for Josh as well in that, um, you know, in no small part because your work really foregrounds questions of power and materiality and control. Um, your work often is often critical of moralistic conceptions of racism and anti-racism. Um, you wrote, I'm going to quote you here from a piece of yours, which I believe this is from your piece, Why Are Anti-Colonial Academics Being Accused of Anti-Semitism, which we're going to talk about a couple of these questions yeah. are related to this. Um, quote, only in moral conception, sorry, only in this moral conception is it possible to conflate anti-Zionism, a form of opposition to colonial domination, with anti-Semitism, a form of racism which, like all racisms, is inextricable from colonialism. Responding to accu accusations of anti-Semitism using the language of morality therefore runs the risk of being unable to disentangle anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism and thus compound the anti-materialist view of this racism rather than unsettling it." End quote. So these are particularly challenging times on this front in particular. Um, would you start by saying a little bit more about this moral conception of racism and anti-racism that you're discussing here? And, you know, do you have any initial remarks you'd like to make about, you know, this, 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 that passage and just generally? 
Sure, look, thanks so much again for having me. And I, I should say that I'm on Gadigal Wanga land and it is a part of what's known as Sydney in so-called Australia. And I'm saying this particularly today, not only because I want to acknowledge my complicity with settler colonization in this land and also as somebody who was born on occupied Palestine, Palestinian land, so I have the misfortune to occupy these two positions, um, but also because um, Aboriginal activists have been so staunch in their commitment to standing together with Palestinian activists in this time and for a long time, um, like many Indigenous activists around the world, recognising shared position of indigeneity. And maybe later on we'll talk about the perversion of Zionists co-opting that positionality of indigeneity, because it kind of does link, I suppose, in some kind of way to this argument that I was trying to make about moralism um, or the appeal to morality as kind of, you know, the way in which anti-racism should be presented. And the article that you're referring to is actually published in an anti-Zionist left-wing Jewish um, publication called Vashti out of the UK. And shout out to them because they do really, really important work, um, as do, you know, many uh, anti-Zionist Jewish publications and activist groups and, you know, including those I'm um, happy to be a part of my collective here in um, Sydney, Tzedek. Um, but I think it was difficult in recent times. I recently rejoined Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it now, just because of what's going on. Um, not because I think I've got anything in particularly important to say, but because, you know, comrades were asking me to raise my voice. And I do think it's important for us all to raise our voices. And that is one medium that we can do it immediately. So I, I made this point about the limitations of the moral uh, perspective on anti-racism. And I don't think it was necessarily, it wasn't possible for me to elaborate on it in that short form. So I welcome the opportunity to do it here. And the position I was taking was um, reflecting on a kind of a, a dual experience of two people who'd been accused of anti-Semitism for their reflections on Zionism. One was the Cameroonian philosopher Achille Mbembe, um, who was accused of anti-Semitism for making some very mild links between um, uh, Zionism and um, anti-Semitism and racism. Uh, and he was then disinvited a few years ago by a small cultural festival in Germany for merely placing these things uh, side by side. In the particular case, of, he was actually talking about apartheid. Sorry, I should have made that clear. Um, and so, you know, to talk about apartheid in relation to Zionism and anti-Semitism was beyond the pale, despite the fact that, as we know, you know, human rights organizations have finally, uh, you know, caught up with Palestinians who for such a long time have been saying that Israel is a perfect example of, of an apartheid regime uh, and so on and so forth. And he was disinvited from that cultural event. And he then, um, you know, responded to this and did something that I think is perfectly understandable in that he said that it was, you know, completely repugnant to be accused of anti-Semitism um, you know, and that it's completely contrary to his morality and his standpoint on racism and so on and so forth. And I contrasted that in the article to the case of Uriah Boutelja, who is used to be the spokesperson for the movement of the indigenous of the Republic in France. She's a French Algerian uh, thinker, um, you know, activist, uh, somebody who's informed my thinking now for a really long time since I first came across the the movement in uh, when it launched in 2005 um, and I think as somebody who has offered us such an important critique of the role um, that elites uh, in the imperial core uh, ascribe to anti-semitism and her point was so just to, to give a part of history of what she was talking about she was referring to the case of um, somebody who'd won, uh, she'd won Miss Provence, so like a region of France, she'd been, you know, she'd been crowned a beauty queen and she had an Israeli father, this woman has an Israeli father. And so some, some people made some remarks about this fact. And of course they were accused of anti-Semitism and the link was of course, you know, all Muslims are anti-Semitic, uh, very, you know, we, we know the extent to which Islamophobia is such a feature of French uh, public culture and so on and so forth. And Uriah Boutelja wrote an article in the French progressive, I suppose, online publication Mediapal, which later on was taken down due to kind of clamor about her being anti-Semitic. Uh, 
And what she was saying was that, you know, April Benayoum, who was the name of this, this woman who'd been, you know, the beauty queen, she um, had a choice to associate herself with Israel, but she also had a choice not to do so. And she said, you know, the, the anti-colonial, the decolonial struggle is a, you know, it's a, a place that is welcoming of everybody. And all she had to do was come over to the other side. So basically her point was that there's absolutely no legitimacy in making a direct link between being Jewish and being Zionist or being pro-colonial. And in that, and in making that case, she was absolutely adamant that those who made anti-Semitic remarks against April Benayoum were, you know, that she completely disagreed with them. But nonetheless, of course, Uriah was accused of anti-Semitism because of the conflation between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. Now, her point was to say, she used the MS Hazel quote in which he said, nobody colonizes innocently. Uh, to make the case that nobody is a Zionist innocently because we have to understand Zionism as a colonial racist project and nothing to do with anti-Semitism. She wanted to separate between these two things. And she says, and I'm confident in making this accusation that, you know, in espousing her Israeliness or her connection to Israel, April Benayoum is not innocent because she said, I've already um, put myself on trial and judged myself as um, guilty because I live in the imperial core. And even if I am, uh, you know, faced with racism as a person of color within that, within French context, if we understand race and racism as a global, as, you know, fundamental feature of the global colonial project, then those of us who live in the imperial core are equally guilty of its perpetuation. Um, and so for making this point, and sorry for going on very long, just in order to just make my argument clear, uh, or really to make the argument that she was making clear and to which I attach myself and, and from which I learn, um, what she was trying to say is that we need political responses to uh, race as a technology of rule and to appeal constantly to the moral and to be indignant about being associated with racism is a dead end. Uh, because it individualizes the problem of racism and detaches the individual as, you know, the moral actor from the placement of their role within this global racial colonial order. Um, and so, of course, when people said to me on Twitter, yes, but of course, to oppose Zionism is a moral stance. Well, it is a moral stance, of course, but we cannot end it there because one's morality is so bound up with one's individual you know one's individuality and that dissociates us as kind of individual moral actors from the global movement uh of which we we, we must be a part yeah you said something in there and i'm i'm trying to go back to it so you you talked about um yeah this desire it's like this fear of not being called racist, right? Of mm. of and and I think about that a lot right now too, because you know the way that we're seeing um, anti-Semitism, sort I mean, used right now in a very specific way, you know. Um, and anti, you know, to be very clear you know, anti-Semitism is a horrible thing, right? We, we know the, the, the effects of anti-Semitism. But it's also being used... I mean, yesterday, you, you had the, the White House press secretary say that... Or yesterday or the day before, I can't remember exactly. Mm. But, but she said... Um, she compared anti-Zionists, which include, you know... Uh, tens of thousands of Jewish people who are, you know, mobilizing against what's going on right now, calling for a ceasefire, right? Going to Grand Central Station, going to Washington, yeah. D.C., you know, um, and it equated this with neo-Nazis in Charlottesville, you know, and I thought, you know, I mean, what a, what a cynical, and, and just talk about weaponizing that, um, that kind of moral concern, right? Of like, mm. oh, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna paint all of you with this racist brush, you know, in just hoping that you will be fearful of taking a stance that we're all saying, hey, if you equate with this, you're supporting terrorism. Or if you um, you know, if you support if if you're against Israel's right to defend itself, then you're anti-Semitic. 
right? And I don't know. I'm just, I'm in a moment where I'm really, I told you before, I, I interviewed a bunch of students this week and they're all taking these stances. And I mean, a lot of them are anti-Zionist Jews who are very indignant with the administrations and how they're responding to them. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, anyway, I don't, I, I don't know if you have thoughts on that, but it's just that 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 point about being, cons you know, the way that people don't the way that I guess Israel or the Zionist projects in some ways weaponizes that uh, that claim of, of mm -hmm. anti-Semitism to try to get people fearful of criticizing it as a state. I don't know if, you know. That yeah, no, absolutely. I mean. Look, in my work for a really long time, I've tried to explain that the um, the struggle, no, let's not call it the struggle, anti-antisemitism or what my my friend Anna Esther Yunus calls the war on antisemitism, echoing the idea of the war on terror and the war on drugs. So an elite top-down state-driven project against antisemitism, at least on paper, is, um, I argue in my book, Why Race Still Matters, presented or in, is in fact a kind of a proxy for anti-racism. So because the state or elite institutions or elite media figures, whoever they might be, present themselves as opposed to anti-Semitism, that's the limitations of their anti-racism. And this is because of a longer history going back to the aftermath of the Nazi Holocaust, the Shoah, in which, um, and not immediately afterwards, it's important to understand that this is very much bound up with the aftermath of 1967, the so-called Six Day War, and the elevation of the case of anti-Semitism as a legitimation for, for Zionism, you suddenly have this concern with anti-Semitism where actually the European states following the Holocaust were trying to, you know, pressure it under the carpet and not actually deal with the legacy of um, anti-Semitism understood as fundamental to European racial rule and its foundations, uh, trying to kind of get past that and put it firmly in the past. Anti-Semitism then starts to become, um, you know, starts to be on the agenda because of course, uh, the Palestinian people rising up against Zionism were very much uh, part of a global um, anti-colonial struggle, which the West, um, the Euro-American, you know, powers that be had to um, crush uh, by any means necessary. And so when we understand anti-Semitism as a tool of um, ongoing racial colonial power, um, I mean, anti I, I mean the discourse about the fight against anti-Semitism, the, the so-called, let's use the terminology of war on anti-Semitism, because I think, um, you know, Anna Esther Yunus's conceptualization is extremely powerful. Um, so that war on anti-Semitism is not, has nothing to do with actual concern for Jews. It's a tool um, in the kind of the ideological, um, you know, the, the kind of the ideological racial regime of the West in its new iteration. So kind of, you know, using Cedric Robinson's formulation of the racial regime as kind of this recursive, um, you know, this recursive formulation that kind of builds on older forms of older regimes and kind of recalibrates itself for the purposes of the present and so on and so forth. You get anti-Semitism being given a formative role within all of that, right? So any idea that the war on anti-Semitism is based on any kind of real concern for Jews, notwithstanding what individual people might feel, I mean, they might really feel that they really have concern for Jews, I think as a political tool of domination in the ideological struggle of um, the Europe, American powers against the, the majority of the world, quite frankly, um, that's the way it has to be understood. And once we understand it in that way, we can um, understand the way it is being manipulated. I personally don't like this terminology of weaponization, although I understand why it's used, because as somebody said um, to me recently, all forms of racism are a weapon. So the idea of um, talking about anti-Semitism rather than the war on anti-Semitism as the weapon is problematic. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a collapsing together of a few different things. And and also it isn't very, um, it kind of doesn't recognize, as you said yourself, that anti-Semitism exists. And actually um, the main targets of anti-Semitism, I think in the current conjuncture are actually anti-Zionist Jews and by proxy people who stand with them, because of course we're cast in the role of not real Jews or bad Jews. Um, and that 
you know, we can talk about that maybe in another question, but that kind of is very much how actually existing anti-Semitism is wielded. And it's actually often wielded by particular um, Jews who are fundamental to the war on anti-Semitism against other Jews. And it's certainly wielded by Israel against Jews who are considered the wrong kind of Jews. And all you have to do is go online and witness um, Israeli soldiers beating up ultra-Orthodox uh, men who are opposed to Zionism in the streets of Jerusalem to see the extent to which anti-Semitism is foundational to Zionist ideology and practice. That's great. Thank you for that. And and thank you for the correction. Yeah, I mean, the weaponization is not the right term, but I do like that. No, but it's a common uh, term and it's 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 fine. I mean, I, it's just important, I think, just to, to be clear about you know, because we don't want to isolate, we don't want to kind of participate in the exceptionalization of anti-Semitism. The idea that I want to foreground here is that anti-Semitism, like all forms of racism, are co-constitutive of each other and they work in tandem. So then we want to talk about how all forms of racism are a weapon against um, negatively racialized peoples. 100%. Um, so in that same piece, uh, you know, again, it's it's called Why Are Anti-Colonial Academics Being Accused of Anti-Semitism? Um, you write, quote, to be an anti-colonial Jew is anathema, not only to the communal gatekeepers who stand steadfast with the racial colony of Israel, but to those Gentiles who use our tragedy to excul exculpate their own continuing complicity with racism and colonialism at home and abroad. This binding of Jewishness to Israel works anti-Semitically to deny Jews the capacity to defy this destiny, to have, as Fanon might put it, any ontological resistance. So I certainly have seen a lot of this, you know, derision, uh, even on the parts of Western, like anti-capitalist or Marxist left folks with regards to sort of applying anti-colonial analysis to the situation of Palestinians. Um, but you're talking about this, you know, really kind of of the perspective of you know, this, this idea of the anti-colonial Jew itself, uh, you know, is anathema in this, in yeah. this idea with relation to Israel. Um, can you talk a little bit about this formula formulation you're making and um, say a bit more about the claim you're making here with regards to Israel Jewishness and, you know, decolonial or anti-colonial, um, you know, practice thinking, etc. cetera. Mm. Yeah. First I'm, I'm I haven't, I'd be really interested to hear more about, you know, how how these leftists are managing to separate Palestinians from the anti-colonial cause, but maybe we can talk about that later, but I find that really astonishing. It's, it's a very, honestly, like, it's kind of, you know, these folks, it's like sort of like either the leftists who don't take seriously at all settler colonialism as oh, yeah. you know left you know i mean you have them in australia we have them in the united states there's also <laughs> ones in in the uk and so so on um so it's kind of that similar to the conversation we had last year with you and um I michael and alex on, yeah. yeah michael and alex on their mm -hmm. book you know looking at these kind of so-called class first politics but that don't yeah, have no way of grappling with imperialism and colonialism, mm. et cetera. Yeah, it's, yeah. I, I see it as manifestations of that. Some of it is German leftists too, which have a very oh, yeah. specific, Germany has a very specific, uh, you know, kind of role here. But yeah, anyways, yeah. Okay, okay. No, I get that. And I think it's it's quite interesting watching, you know, social media leftists sit at home and tell Palestinians how to resist and what kind of, cultural traditions they should appeal to in their resistance i mean it's interesting and horrifying at the same time amical cabral comes to comes to mind i think anyway um yeah so like what was i trying to get at in this piece i mean i think the point that i was trying to make and i've thought about it further and i want to you know suggest an adaptation to what i was trying to say but basically in my book and in this article i was trying to you know respond to the idea that some, again that anti-semitism uh, or the struggle against anti-Semitism is exceptionalized and anti-Semitism as a form of racism is exceptionalized. Um, and that therefore the fight against anti-Semitism should be separated out or in practice is separated out by elites and those again involved in the war on anti-Semitism from other forms of anti-colonial resistance. 
But what I have come to understand in more recent times is that actually, and this is coming to the fore, I think, particularly here and relates to the comment that I made in the opening about, you know, this idea that Zionists are or the Jews are indigenous to the land of Palestine, is that actually Zionism has and Zionists in the current conjuncture and for a long time have made appeal to Zionism as a form of anti-colonialism, which is incredibly perverse. Um, and it's kind of been ramped up in the, let's say, the post-2020 moment with more attention to, you know, decolonial theory and anti-racism within institutions, where suddenly Zionism can be folded into, um, you know, decoloniality in very similar ways to how the Hindu uh, far right is mobilizing decoloniality as a kind of an agenda um, in order to uh, to ramp up fascism in that context, and there's a real you know perversity I think happening, but it's also very um, it's very interesting for those of us who are working within let's say scholarly institutions because of course this is all about political economy of you know um, things like research funding and book deals and all this kind of thing, which might not be very important in the grand scheme of things. But of course, because academics often set the tone in terms of, you know, what can be discussed and what can't, then it is extremely worrying when there's a particular, you know, um, or, you know, a particular argument being advanced about how Zionism has to be understood not as a colonial um, ideology and regime, but as a, um, as a form of anti-colonial struggle um, you know, and 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 the 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 problem with it particularly is, of course, who is that anti-colonial struggle, um, or and you know, who is that? What's that uh, anti-colonial formation positioned against? Well, there's a kind of a mixing of things where Jews, uh, who possibly can be described in particular areas of Eastern Europe as a kind of an internal colony in some cases in particular historical periods, but not in all, and importantly, very differently, depending on what location we're talking about. So we can't generalize this at all, then go and form this state, which is seen as a kind of a liberatory practice. And, you know, then who are the Palestinians in all that? Do they then become the colonial masters against whom this um, beleaguered minority, uh, the indigenous people are, you know, the Jews as the indigenous people are fighting back against. I mean, the perversion of that has to be laid laid bare, obviously. And this is where this whole uh, discourse about Jews as indigenous um, becomes very, uh, you know, needs to be needs to be discussed, because, of course, Palestinian people, as people like Stephen Salaita has written, you know, very importantly in his book on interstroke nationalism, um, have positioned themselves politically as indigenous peoples. Um, predominantly via their appeal or their their co-struggle with other indigenous peoples in other locations and other colonized peoples in other locations. And his argument, I think, and the, I, I don't want to represent his argument, but the way I understand it is that that becomes um, a significant way of mobilizing because of the ongoing um, you know, conditions of colonialism under which they exist, under which many indigenous people continue to exist. In essence, there's no ontological, um, you know, position of indigeneity. Indigeneity is always formed in relation to the experience and the practice of colonization. So in that context, Palestinian people talk about themselves as indigenous and also create these links, these transnational links of solidarity to other people. So how is a, the, a Zionist um, project, how does that, how could that be positioned within uh, such a scenario given that in this instance, Israel and Zionism is the colonial power that is oppressing and annihilating or attempting to annihilate uh, the people who they, whose land they have occupied. I mean, again, it, that, that stark perverseness needs to be, perversion needs to be uh, laid bare. I mean, I could say a few other things on that and particularly about, you know, I don't want to go on for too long, but there are very worrying kind of link-ups, albeit minoritarian, between um, Zionists who claim indigeneity and um, certain um, indigenous politics. Uh, so, for example, in so-called Australia that I could talk about if you if you want me to. Yeah, sure. I've seen a little bit of stuff just like on Twitter that that might. Yeah. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, so I gave a paper on this actually at the inaugural conference of the Institute for the Critical Study of Zionism, which shout out 
to them. Uh, that was an amazing conference that took place on the 13th and 14th of October. And it was really, you know, crazy that it was taking place as this genocide was um, was being unleashed. And um, so I, I spoke about, I mean, this is again, and like a long and complex story. And it, again, it's a dovetailing of two moments in the Australian context that people may or may not be aware of, but there's just been on the on that very day, on the, thir- on the 14th of October, um, a referendum that was held here on, um, on an indigenous voice to parliament. So people were asked to vote on whether the constitution should be changed to enshrine this indigenous voice to parliament in the constitution, which would basically act as an advisory body of indigenous people to the government. And there were lots of arguments on all sides, including, I have to say, a kind of a radical no position espoused by um, you know, prominent indigenous activists who didn't want, who, who actively rejected being recognized in the colonial constitution. But produ- effectively at the end, the referendum didn't pass because of a more racist no vote that was advanced by, um, you know, predominantly the leader of the opposition, arguing strongly against it. And ultimately 60% of the population voted against um, this, this, um, this indigenous voice. But what was pointed out is that one of the prominent, um, you know, people who was involved in the campaign for The Voice was um, a a tax lawyer, a Jewish tax lawyer, uh, Mark Liebler, who's uh, well known, I think, in Australia. Um, And he made his arguments in favor of The Voice by arguing that indigenous people and Jews had a shared indigeneity because Jews were indigenous to Israel in the same way that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were indigenous to this continent. Um, and, you know, so I, my point was, was in this paper that how easy it was to mobilize these claims of indigeneity within what ostensibly would be um, it's supposed to have been an anti-racist project or a project, you know, basically making the claim that indigenous people uh, needed representation even uh, arguing, you know, within the kind of caveats of the limitations of the politics of representation. But ultimately, the vote boiled down to did you see Aboriginal people as um, human beings or not? I mean, that's literally what it boiled down to. And, the ter- you know, the actual terms and conditions of what the voice was going to be about was secondary to the actual, you know, to the actual divide in the population. What's been interesting and horrifying to watch, because, again, remember, 14th of October is the day of the referendum. Mark Liebler prominent to the end, arguing uh, for the voice, this genocide is un- is unleashed and we see him on social media going extremely hard on the side of the Zionist state um, with absolutely no irony um, at all. So I think this is this is why it's so important for those of us who are who are attentive to the co-optation of the language and politics of anti-racism and you mentioned earlier about multicultural kind of statements being put out by universities. This is why it's so important for us to be attentive to these kinds of um, these, yeah, these kinds of deviations, because this is exactly in this way that our language, our language of anti-racism, can be co-opted for very, very nefarious ends. Yeah, and I think we'll be able to get into that a little bit more in the next question. Um, so I spent the last couple of weeks, you know, talking. I just put out a piece today in Prism Reports that's about like campus organizing, student organizing uh, in the United States over the last couple of weeks. And so I talked to a lot of student organizers or student activists or at least people that were going to protests and rallies and things like that. And, um, you know, there's 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 different climates at different universities, obviously, you know, as you yeah. would expect. Um one of the common things that came across um, was that, you know, there was a quite open bias against, um, you know, solidarity or demands related to the Palest- to Palestinians in this moment, um, mm. especially anything that was advocacy for Palestinian self-determination, right? Like anything that posed, um, you know, Palestinian resistance within an anti-colonial framework or, um, you know, obviously anytime somebody said from the river to the sea, like these things are just ultimate, like the next day a university president would say, you know, abhorrent 
support for terrorism was going on yesterday, Mm -hmm. even to the extent to where one student, you know, talked about how they had had um, they had had vigils. And this was seen as um, what was the exact term? But it was it was seen as glorification of terrorism. And the only thing that I could possibly like pull from that was because they use the term martyrs right but that's Mm. you know this is this is how palestinians refer to people who died in the struggle you know um and um so so you know so there's that there's that going on on the one hand um you know obviously there is this this rise of and you know uh, this is coming through the anti-defamation league which is like you know fully at this point you know being very clear that anti-zionist jews are are bad jews right as as you kind of Mm. said earlier and you know um that that anti-zionism is anti-semitism is part of their their current platform um but they're the ones that are saying that the claims of uh an uptick in anti-semitism of 400 percent that's then being used now by the fbi and the the doj Mm. and dhs i think to mobilized i think they said cyber security units onto college campuses mm-hmm. or something like that and so it's i mean obviously like i'm sure that there are legitimate upticks in in anti-semitism um i also know that i spoke to a few muslim and arab students and they certainly are very aware of a climate of heightened islamophobia um yeah. you know one one girl in particular just said like she said there's easy targets here and i said well what do you that mean and she said well if somebody's wearing hijab like they're getting surveilled they're getting followed they're getting yeah. harassed you know um so that there's that and then um i think that uh let's see sorry i'm just going through my notes here um so anyways th- uh, let's just set that dynamic and then there's a there's a quote yeah. from you that i want to read which i think is from um why race why race still matters um, so th- this is what I wanted to get to is really thinking about um, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, right? Mm-hmm. And and also anti-Zionism in here as well, because they're, I mean, obviously anti-Zionism, I think, well, I feel and I think you feel is that, that that that's not a racism, really. It's, an, it's really an anti-racism or an anti-colonial position, right? Of course, yeah. Um, you know. And anti-Semitism and Islamophobia are forms of racism, but as you talk about, they 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 work on kind of different ways. As you, you look at some of the other scholars who've looked at them, but so I'm mm. going to read this quote: um, "Because Jews are a race, people and Muslims are a faith." Um, sorry, so that so there you're one of the that's a tweet. Making, yeah, what's that? That's a tweet. That's okay. a tweet by somebody. Okay, so you're citing this. I can explain. So, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so this is a case study in how race attaches itself to and detaches itself from categories and context for reasons of political expedience. The multi-ethnic and multinational national character of Islam's adherents is considered to disqualify Muslims from being considered a race, hence mm-hmm. delegitimating the charge that they face racism. In addition to the fact that such a reading erases the existence of black Jews and Jews of color. The distinction relies on a purely biologistic account of race that paradoxically reifies it, thus upholding the racialization of the Jews which underpinned the explosion of 19th century political anti-Semitism. Aronovich and others use the argument that Jews are a race while Muslims are only a religion because they seek to negate and downplay Muslims, uh, Muslim people's experiences of Islamophobia. But this is not a recent phenomenon, as recent a phenomenon as it may seem. Prominent Zionists such as Max Nordau and Arthur Rupin uh, promoted ideas of Jewish supremacy, explicitly conceptualized Jews as a race and Zionism as a eugenic project. So that's the end of the quote. So yeah, anyways, I just wanted to talk to you about that quote. I found it interesting. I found some resonance with some of these things that I was thinking through and just get your thoughts. Yeah. So just to make it clear. So this is, I just actually bookmarked it in the book just to, to make it clear. So that basically this was in, um, 
I want to say 2018 or 2019, and I can't remember exactly, it doesn't really matter. This British journalist, David Aronovich, he tweeted um, that for many perfectly reasonable people, this is his words, for many perfectly reasonable people, a read across from anti-Semitism to Islamophobia has to be argued, not axiomatically stated. Why? I've explained already, because Jews are a race, stroke people, and Muslims are a faith. So he's trying to say, he's basically trying to discredit the idea that Islamophobia is a real form of racism, because he's operationalizing this biologistic notion of race, and he's saying that Jews are um, genetically coherent as a people and Muslims because they come from all kinds of ethnicities and nations and so on um, are not. And therefore they're a religion and you can't be racist against a religion. And that's you know a very, very common argument that's been predominant, particularly in European redefinitions of racism uh, over the course of the war on terror, but which also pre-existed. So this ha entire idea that you can't be racist towards Muslims because Muslims are, quote, not a race, has been fundamental to how, you know, uh, ideologically um, Islamophobia has proceeded or how Islamophobia has been denied, I should say. And so my argument was to say that this is actually very weird, uh, particularly because David Ar Aronovich is Jewish, because of what he's actually trying to, to do or what he doesn't quite understand that he's doing, I think, because I don't think he has enough knowledge about this, is to re-racialize Jews in the narrow eugenicist definitions of you know, race that tie um, racialized, you know, racialized description or racial, racialized positionality to um, you know, being inherently genetically different to other people, which is of course something that uh, was officially denied as erroneous and a murderous ideology in the aftermath of the Holocaust by all of the European states, all of the all of the Western states came together. If you look at the UNESCO Declaration of Race and Racism from 1950 and all of its various iterations afterwards, come out and say this was um, a terrible, uh, murderous ideology that has to be categorically denied. And in my work, and you know, I'm not the only person who have made this case, Stuart Hall, most famously, Anne Stoller, many other people have written about this, that to make this you know, strict separation between a biological understanding of race and a cultural understanding of race is just not to understand how race actually evolved as a set of discourses over its, you know, however many years history you want to put on it. And there are arguments that we don't need to get into here about how long, you know, where, when you want to date the origins of race, but predominantly it originates within Europe as a technology of differentiation um, that Cedric Robinson refers to as racialism. And it's, and it, and it uses different kinds of discourse in order to embed itself. So it appeals as much to culture, religion, ethnicity, um, and nation and geographical location as it does to later iterations of biology. And actually, if you look at the progression of racial discourse over time, it's only in the 19th century and on that you really have the solidification of race as a kind of a, um, you know, inherently linked to some kind of difference that is written in what Stuart Hall calls the, the genetic code. So something unseen within all of us that kind of drives, um, you know, everything about us, um, and which is fundamental to, you know, common common sense understandings of racism, but which very conveniently, um, you know, fades out of the picture, the fact that the biological, the cultural, the religious, the geographical, and all of these types of things have always coalesced and, you know, work together to prop each other up in the construction of um, racial discourse. So then to, to put Jews back in the box of these guys are genetically unique and different and therefore are discriminated against only on this basis. And Muslims are these kind of, you know, diverse group of people who have this strange religion uh, that is very bad and we don't like it. And therefore anything that we say about them is part of the course or is, you know, can, can be said is um, is fundamentally is a fundamental tool of the war on anti-Semitism by exceptionalizing anti-Semitism and making it different and worse than other forms of racism.
Yeah, I think that's so true. And it's also fascinating. I mean, in a not in a good way, but like, I think about how like after 9-11, you know, like, there was there were all these attacks on people and like, you know, like white settlers that get enraged and get into the, you know, these frenzies and like, they're not actually taking the time to determine if people are Muslim or not, right? Like, like, so it's also one of those things, too, where it's like, you know, it, it's like we're talking about West Asian people. We're talking about, um, you know, Middle Eastern people. We're talking about Arabs. But it could be, you know, in many cases, it, it you know, the term Islamophobia. Or Brazilian, some, like. Uh, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> it could be Latin American. Yeah. Right. Like and, um, you know, that that it's it's fascinating in some respect because like, you know, the the when when the white house said they're going to deploy you know dhs or whatever else that they're going to so, and you know who knows what this will actually look like onto college campuses like they mm. say we're doing it because of the uptick of anti-semitism but we're going to protect against both islamophobia and anti-semitism that's what they say mm. right mm. and it's like but you you know like but again like with this idea of uh, thinking about Islamophobia as this, you know, nebulous thing. Like, I think I was listening to a discussion the other day from Lamas Deek, who's a, mm. a Palestinian um, attorney in the United States, does mm. like human rights work and actually has done work around, um, uh, what are they called? The support for terrorism laws, you know, because it, yeah. the, the, all, all of the Palestinian resistance is characterized basically as as terrorist organizations by the United States. Um, and most European countries as well. And, um, but she made this comment about how, you know, really the target initially is Palestinians, but then it expands outward to be anti-Muslim, anti-Arab, anti, you know, and, and it, we see something similar in terms of, you know, mm. how, I mean, there's a lot of differences, obviously, you know, I don't think that there's, I don't think 9-11 is a good, metaphor and i think it's being used quite cynically in these times in a number of ways but i think mm. that the the ways that um the response to 9 11 was so you know disproportionate and vast in terms of kind of who got targeted by um you know surveillance and vigilantism yeah. you know um there is resonance there i think you know. Yeah, absolutely. I look, I think it's very interesting for them to say, of course, they have to say on the face of it that they're going to be looking out for anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. But because anti-Semitism is being construed as uh, a form of racism and a crime, I suppose, um, that is um, mainly perpetuated by Muslims and Arabs, uh, and black people to a certain extent. Um, I think, you know, we mustn't forget how in recent years black people have been predominantly accused of anti-Semitism as though they were the main proponents of anti anti-Semitism, as though anti-Semitism originated with black people. We know very well that it's a European project and always has been. So effectively, I think what it's going to lead to is if you're looking for anti-Semitism predominantly among Muslim, Arab and black people, then that's where you're going to find it. And that's going to paint out completely the fact that, um, well, A, the Islamophobia that I think, I don't like to play this game of comparing who's who's more at risk, right? But I think we, we can safely say that in the current um, era, when we think about the, when we think about racism as a state project, um, it's definitely uh, Muslims and Arabs who are much more targeted by this, and obviously black people who are much more targeted by the state than than Jews are. Um, we could see, and we have seen, um, anti-Semitic attacks, and I don't want to downgrade them by any stretch of the imagination, but I think this has to be understood as part of the concerted effort to separate or to basically nullify the existence of state racism or to see that as part of the common sense that's necessary because if you see Muslim, Arabs and black people and indigenous people as a threat to the state, then any action against them is legitimized, right? And then leave, you know, as the only form of racism that actually exists is kind of lone wolf attacks by um, people who you think are, um, you know, probably insane or extremist and all the rest of it, or perhaps 
you know, small groups of far right extremists who quite frankly, are very often in line with Zionism and have been the biggest cheerleaders for Zionism. All we have to look at is, you know, you know, if any of the mobilizations for Israel that have taken place over the years and, and in the recent weeks, there's been a significant white supremacist far right presence. Somebody like Tommy Robinson, founder of the English Defense League, is always there waving his, his Israeli flag um, and proudly stood stands with um, Zionist Jews on these on these rallies. So it's not people like that who are going to come under scrutiny, even though we know that they are responsible for fomenting huge amounts of popular racism against refugees, against migrants and against Muslim people um, and also against Jews, uh, because, you know, <laughs> These kinds of people have been so fundamental to the espousing of the so-called great replacement theory and great replacement theory in the end of the day holds Jews responsible for, um, you know, mounting multiculturalism immigration. So the whole thing, like in the end of the day, reverts back to Jews perversely, even though these Jews who see themselves as Zionists and are aligning with the far right um, claim that, uh, you know, the, the greatest threat facing humanity is uh, you know, anti-Semitic attacks. And and what we have, just the last part of that, I think, you know, obviously is the criminalization of protest because we saw, for example, uh, when the Black Jewish Alliance and shout out to them in London, uh, Sisters Uncut and those amazing uh, people lead, um, you know, sit-ins in London train stations over the last week. We have somebody like Karen Pollock, who's the director of the Holocaust Education Trust in the UK, um, say that uh, Jewish people returning from work were terrified um, when they, you know, landed up in the station and saw these people sitting on, sitting down, uh, holding a sit-in for Palestine. This sit-in was led by Jewish people, um, with allies, of course, but predominantly by Jewish people. But they were Jewish um, people who are anti-Zionists, and many of them are Black Jewish people. So that obviously is the wrong kind of Jew. So the racism of the war on anti-Semitism against Jews of color and black Jews also has to be highlighted here. And we know that those are going to be the people who are predominantly policed and who are going to face um, real threats to their personal safety and to their livelihood. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's interesting. Another thing I talked to uh, Students for Justice in Palestine organizer, you know, for the piece and like their organization has been just directly targeted by the state, you know, um, basically there's a, a move on several levels to basically come after them for material support. Yeah. Um, but the, the thing that they said amid all of that really was like that, um, you know, actually like being in the organization and being organized and having your, your support and being connected to, you know, the resources and things like that, that like, they f they actually aren't as worried about their own members facing yeah. repression or things like that. Yeah. The the folks that they see, you know, getting repressed and getting doxxed and getting losing job offers, et cetera, are often black allies of yeah. their their cause that are not in an organization necessarily who are just like folks who show up in solidarity or who write statements or things like this. And you know, I, I saw that also reflected in some of my interviews with different students of some of the most fearful people about um, the repression, about being doxxed. Um, you know, they, they didn't have any kind of organizational infrastructure to support them. And so yeah. on some level, it meant their organization wasn't being demonized because they weren't in an organization, but also meant they didn't have that um, those structures and the support and even just mm -hmm. those comrades, right, to be able to struggle with you. And so, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I thought about that, too, as well, you know, just of it, it, it dovetails. But certainly, as you were talking about the sort of targeting of black people, other people of color, especially if they're not, you know, in some type of formation where they have legal support and things like that, that they mm -hmm. can access, you know, I think is definitely a strategy. And that you know, it's kind of counterinsurgency 101 is that you try to separate out different groups that are in expressing solidarity with one another. You figure out who can I isolate, you know, from from these groups. And so, you know, and, and maybe yeah, and that's, that's why being in. Sorry, I was just going to no, say that's why being say, in an organization is so important. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. But it, it also. um yeah, no, that is, that is, I'll just leave that. So let's see, we got Sorry. a comment here. No, 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 it's all right. 
Um, so today is Edward Said's birthday. Uh, love to hear Alana or Jared's thoughts about some of his work in the context of the specific moment. You know, the person we should have Sina Rahmani on to to answer this question because I am not a Edward Said yeah. um, scholar, although I do appreciate obvious his work around Orientalism yeah. and um, you know. But I don't know if you have any reflections there. Yeah, I'm not know. I'm not an Edward Said scholar either, and I think it's important to say that you know I'm not a scholar of Palestine either. There are important Palestinian scholars um, who's you know, voices are are so important in this time to help us understand uh, what's going on and, for, and who have been so fundamental to all of our understanding. So my focus is on specifically how, um, you know, on anti and on, you know, the fight against Zionism within the uh, within our context here, my context here in Australia, Europe and the US and so on and so forth. So that's important to say. I don't think we should all be speaking on everything. But I do want to say one thing uh, which relates to what we were talking about just before, and that is, um, you know, Said's unequivocal stance against Zionism, even if if he himself was somebody who worked at an elite university, uh, I suppose could have taken a back seat in many ways if he'd wanted to. Like so many scholars who are, you know, decolonial, anti-racist, post-colonial and so on, who we see as, you know, who we witness being rather silent in this moment, um, which, you know, many of us have been absolutely horrified by. There's that wonderful picture of Saeed doing the rounds of him throwing a stone um, against the occupying forces. And meanwhile, we see people being scared to even utter the word genocide. And people who are in a much, uh, in a position of much greater comfort than Saeed, because they benefit from whiteness, many of them, um, you know, are Jewish or they have um, positions of power within the institutions in which they sit. But nonetheless, they kind of they 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 put their what they what they think of as being their personal safety above everything else. But as you correctly said, actually, the amount of repression that people like us face is um, much less than uh, what those who are you know in a position of much greater weakness than us face. And and you know, in the end of the day as many uh, Palestinian activists have been making the case, uh, whatever we, whatever they and we in, a, in alliance with them go through here pales into complete significance in comparison to what is actually happening to Palestinian people as we all watch um, from our relative positions of comfort. So that's what I have to say about Said. He was, you know, I love the way academia loves to use this language of engaged scholarship, you know, <laughs> public engagement and engaged scholarship, but you know, it's been stripped of all meaning. But this is what it actually meant, was to, to have his level of courage, bravery and leadership. Uh, yeah, and I really appreciate you saying that. You know, I think that it is, uh, I think I saw you say something, I want to say you said something on Twitter earlier today. But I know, yeah. I, I know this was you. But yeah, just saying about um, that, yeah, I mean, using our voices is not, is is certainly not everything. And, and I, look, I, like I recognize that I'm not as courageous as the people who are doing direct action right now. And I, I mm. salute the folks that are like out there tearing the roofs off of Elbit buildings and stuff yes. like that for the, for the work that they're doing. And, um, you know, I, you know, I have a family and two kids and I, I'm honestly scared to do stuff like that on a personal level, yeah. you know? Um, but I think that that stuff absolutely needs to be done and it's it's urgent. And, you know, certainly I appreciate folks like Huda, um, Huda Mori, you know, saying yes. like, look, what actually coming to grips with what could be the consequences of what might happen to me for doing what I'm going to do and accepting those is profoundly liberating, too. Mm. And I think that even as we take whatever actions that we do take, that it is important to approach it from that framework of just sort of, you have to accept that, yeah, there, there could be, there very well might be consequences for certain things that you're going to do, but yeah, they, they, they do pale and compare. I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's just, yeah, atrocious what's going on right now. I think people need to test the limits of that. And they also need to, they need to hold other people to account. Um, you know, I've been in a situation like this only a few days ago. I don't want to go into the details of it, but you know, uh, 
where I had to stand up to um, those in a position of power above me trying to police me over uh, my position on Palestine. And I made very sure that other people who, you know, were in the environment with me could hear what was being said in order to expose it. And in the end, they had to back down because, you know, it's one thing to try to say things behind closed doors and send letters and, you know, put pressure on people and all the rest of it. It's another thing for them to have to publicly say that they're not comfortable with um, an academic in an institution that, like all academic institutions, goes on at nauseam about academic freedom uh, to actually try to stop that person from basically just making the point that there's a genocide happening. It shouldn't be controversial to say that there's a genocide happening. And I think we need to expose, not in a, it's not a question of going to war with our colleagues, <laughs> because I do understand that many people are not comfortable. They don't have a history of activism. They don't know exactly what to do and how to do it, but to show people that it's possible and actually it's actually, it's actually quite safe. Um, it's not as dangerous as you think it is. I don't want to discount the fact that people are losing their livelihood and so on, but there are people who are positioned in a particular way who can take that action. And they are the, we are the ones who have to take that upon ourselves. Even if you think that you're speaking out is a drop in the ocean that ultimately all of this is happening. Like there's that kind of pessimistic view. But I think that if everybody says that, then nothing will happen. And what we're seeing now is that I think that the penny has dropped from many people. It's a bridge too far. We could say, you know, where were you last year? Where were you the year before? And why weren't you? And so on. And I include myself. I don't think I was as active on this as I have been over recent years and particularly now. But this is the time and we have to seize this moment, particularly those of us who make our living from teaching and writing about race and racism and colonialism and, de and decoloniality. For those people to be silent is is something I don't think I'll ever forgive them for. Yeah, no, I think that's a really important point. And I think, yeah, folks should be testing those limits. And I think a lot of people are and they're trying to, yeah, they to, to get into that. And I think also... Um, you know, I, I do want to, I, you know, I recognize the, the concern, you know, I, I saw a tweet earlier today from somebody saying sort of, we've done all of these things, right. And it hasn't mm. stopped it yet. So, you know, but it's like one of those things where, you know, I, I, a lot has changed over the last few weeks and a lot has mm. changed over the last several years. And the amount of consciousness and mobilization and protests and speaking out that is happening um, in solidarity to with the Palestinians in this time, I think is really unprecedented, yeah. um, certainly in in my lifetime, I would say. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think that it's it's folks have to keep going. Like, that's the other thing yeah. I would say is that you can't, you can't give up because you feel like, oh, well, I went out and protested or went to this march or yeah. I did this direct action and these things didn't stop, you know, or I, I wrote my people, like whatever you're doing, right? Um, yeah. I think that we're seeing the narratives shift from even some of these very pro-Zionist governments of them realizing oh, like this rhetoric is not working. This, you know, this is still profoundly unpopular. I saw a thing today that was like something like 80% of Democrats and 57% of Republicans uh, are for a ceasefire at this point, mm. right? And I mean, like, you know, that probably that same percentage also supports free healthcare in the United States and nobody gives a shit. So I understand yeah. that. But there's also not... Um, there's also not a movement like that around uh, mm. free healthcare right now. And I do think that yeah. those, those opinions and moving the needle in those ways, um, they do matter. We also have seen, you know, post George Floyd that these shifts in, in public opinion and all of that can be rolled back and that things, you know, what feels like very um, inspiring changes in things uh, can be rather fleeting. Um mm. But I think it's an it it just behooves everybody to to keep the pressure on as much as they yeah. can in as many ways as they yeah. can um, and to step it up as they can, you know. Um, Absolutely. So yeah, I think the narrative of pessimism is is in the end of the day profoundly reactionary, and I think we need to be braver in saying that. That's um, 
I don't think that there's any other position to take. This is what the Palestinian people are asking from us. Uh, yesterday, yeah. a, a young Palestinian activist said to me, you know, they're telling us, keep going, and we have to listen to them. We have to do what they're asking us to do. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, Alana, thank you very much for this conversation. I really appreciated um, your time and sharing your thoughts with me and, our, and oh yeah, all of our listeners out there. Um, shout out to you all. <laughs> Um, thanks everybody for coming through and checking this out and the folks that listen on the replay and, um, yeah, I don't know if you have anything you wanted to say in closing, but I just, uh, I just, conversation. I, thank you. Like, I just wanted to thank you for what you're doing as always. I think, you know, millennials are killing capitalism. You know, it's been so, so fundamental to my own learning over the last few years since you started. And this, you know, this stepping up and doing these lives, I think is, has been so important. I've listened to all of them. I encourage everybody to listen to all of them. Uh, it's really incredibly important work. So even if you think, <laughs> even if you think that, you know, it's not like we all think it's not enough. I think you should know that it's really, really incredibly important to many people. Well, I, that's part of, you know, I, th- I I do have to say, I should, I should say, you know, a lot of people have reached out to me since I started doing this, just to mm-hmm. thank me for doing it, you know, to this, this particular thing and to thank Josh and I for the work we do on the podcast. And um, yeah, I mean, it's been, it's a combination, honestly, of, um, yeah, I think it's important. I think that there's, you know, fortunately, I have access to a lot of brilliant people like yourself and other folks that we've had on that can help us think more clearly on a lot of the the topics that are important in thinking about this, as well as folks mm-hmm. like Palestine Action and others, you know, decolonized yeah. Palestine who are, who are, you know, thinking about how to act or, or really breaking down things from their own context. Um, so, you know, in some ways it's just helping to share the resources that we've, we've developed in terms of all the relationships we've developed doing this podcast for these years. But also um, it is on a, on a very selfish note, it's kind of kept me, uh, kept me sane. I mean, Lara and yeah. Stephen Shihai, when they were talking about, you know, it, there's definitely a therapeutic aspect of just that the world does seem really crazy right now. And it does mm-hmm. seem like there's so many people who, who are out in the streets and who get it. And then there's this other part of the world that is just like oblivious or like, you know, I don't know. And then there's obviously our, our recalcitrant imperialist states that are supporting this. Right. And so, yeah. you know, like, it, it's therapeutic on some level for me also to be able to talk to people who have a very clear um, thinking and, and can help us think through these things together. So I appreciate that mm-hmm. from you and from the others that we've talked to for sure. Thanks right, a thank lot. You.